There are few things in the culinary world as simple and pure as the oyster. It's one of the rawest forms of cuisine. Farming this bivalve is a art. The shape, flavor, and texture all play into care it was given. Neil Maloney has perfected a craft in producing the best California gold oyster. You know, it took a lot to get this, this oyster to look like this. Oysters, a lot of people don't know that, really require a lot of attention. I was a science nerd. I've loved the ocean since I was a little one. I studied marine biology. I learned some of the craft, but more of the science behind it. But when I got into actual farming, a lot of it is just being connected to your farm and, you know, out every day in the water, right. seeing how the oysters are growing, maintaining them once they're out there. We're trying to, like, pump the brakes on what Mother Nature is doing out here because Mother Nature doesn't stop. So I think I see Neil in the distance. So let's see, they're gonna pull up and get me. Yes, that's Neil. Let's do this. What's up, brother? Good to see you. Good to see you, man. Okay. Let's do this. So this is the beginning of the commute right here. This is the, the daily drive to work. <laughs> that's a nice drive. No nine to five traffic. Right. And that's five. that famous rock. Yeah, that's, that's the, the second largest rock in the world, only to the Rock of Gibraltar. Really? Yeah. The Morro Bay Rock. It used to be an island, and they blasted it and quarried it. And so back here, there used to get a lot more surf, and ever since they did that, it totally reshaped the bay. And probably without them doing that, Morro Bay wouldn't be hospitable to oysters as, as well as it is now. Really? Yeah. So is this it right here? Yeah, this is you guys? This is the farm. So. That's it. There it is. Here's the barge where all the there magic happens. 500 square feet floating. <laughs> right? Here's the work barge. Wow. What is this? Empty the oysters into baskets, hand sort them, mm -hmm. and everything's bagged, then it goes right back in the water, so. So different colored bag and different size oysters? Yeah, the racks here hold all different sizes. You know, we sell stuff from two and a half inches all the way up to, you know, like a six inch, seven inch large oyster. So say we'll get an order in, start plucking them out of the water, they're washed and they're on ice. Wow. And then straight away drive into Santa Barbara, pepper the coast. And I do the same thing on Thursday going up to Monterey, and then we ship overnight wow. to Los Angeles and San Francisco. Yeah, you're, the, you're the one stop shop. Yeah. Awesome. Exactly. So, I mean, uh, I guess we're going to get into it. Well, we're probably going to need to get a wetsuit on. Can't Let's wait. do it. <laughs> and who built this, uh, this floating office? It was kind of a collaboration of all the different employees that we've had over the years. We started with one barge, a small little barge, and we kept adding to it, and so it's uh, become a little, a little water world. So these are your boys here? Yeah, we got the crew out here. And the crew over here? So every single one of these flotation devices are locked. Yeah, what you don't see underwater is uh, about 700 oysters. Wow. I think I know what's coming next. Yeah. I think I know what's coming. All right, I'll jump in first. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Welcome to the farm. So now we're surrounded with approximately 2 million oysters. Right. How small do oysters start off? You know, 150 oysters, I could hold them right here in my hand right. when I first put them in here. And then by the time it goes to harvest, this bag might weigh 80 pounds. All right, so now each one of these strips different ages? Um, yeah, the bags here, the, <laughs> the better the lines are floating, typically the lighter the oyster are. But before we take all the effort of pulling this entire line to our barge with the bow, we like to open a few bags up. You got it. So you're just gonna cut that like you're... I want to slip over here. Yeah. All right, opening ceremony. Do it. Just because the mayor of the town. Drop it down a little bit. Get, Get him. Every one of those is cha ching cha ching. <laughs> That's my job here. Wow. Take oh yeah, those are perfect size. Yeah, so they're just they're they're on the smaller side, but it's just it's gonna need to have some more time in the bag. But the next time it goes to layer new shell, it'll be nice and thick, and the cup will start to get deeper and deeper. So the perfect half cup, actually, I mean, it's, it's natural, but you actually play with it a little bit. You, you right, just... you chip off all the shell, okay. then he has to work. It's like going to the gym, oyster gym. So by the time by the time you get this oyster, it's been like pumping iron on the farm, and it's got a really strong muscle, so it can keep its shell closed. We do come out, and the crew will come out and shake the bags. You know, we'll come through and just give each bag a, just a, little, a little shake like that, and then. All it does is break up any oysters that are starting to grow together. It just kind of yeah. I see that sometimes when the oysters come together, that's just lack of lack of uh, right. maintenance. maintenance. Right. Yeah. So this one oyster over 16 months is going to be shaking every day. It's going to be chipped away, going to the gym. It's going to be resting and yeah. just what a process. Yeah, and it might get pulled up and denied and sent back to the water to do it all again. All right. And it might even do that a couple times, but I eventually it'll make its way to the plate. People say, why are oysters so expensive? 
This is why. <laughs> this is why. This is why. Yeah. Here's some oysters that need to get sorted. Everything's hand sorted and grated right here. So these oysters are all different sizes. This is about the smallest oyster that I would sell right here. We call here. them smalls, cocktails, what do we call these? So this is a cocktail. Next size up is our extra small. They're gonna just kind of hang over the end of your thumb. Right. Two fingers wide, a finger width deep. And then right here, we're gonna start getting into the smalls. So when we get up here to the table, you try not to pick up every oyster. You wanna try and group them together. So if I know that all three of these are extra smalls, my cocktails will go down here and my smalls up here. So when you start sorting, sorting, sorting. And that's how I start moving around the table. Nice, I'm gonna mess up your batch really. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so you wanna give it a try? I guess so, so right. I'm obviously it's gonna be small. Yeah, Is largest to smallest. Largest to smallest. Yeah. All right, well, all right. And we'll you grade can... you from there. All right, so clearly yeah, that one goes there. So far good. So far and I mean, good. you have an advantage because you've seen a lot of oysters. <laughs> so you already know. I, I, I have an idea. But... <laughs> I know the West Coast, you don't have high hurricanes or typhoons, but El Nino, or is there anything that's significant that could really damage your oysters? Well, it was kind of weird. Uh, the tsunami in Japan had a large effect on our farm. Really? Yeah. The water went up eight feet and then down negative eight feet all in about five minutes. You know, just imagine that tidal surge and just kind of carved out a 20 foot deep channel in the bay right here. And this barge actually used to be 100 yards uh, to the south. From it, thousands of miles away from the tsunami. Yeah. The, these oysters, this species, wouldn't naturally grow in my bay. So every oyster that's in this bay is because I brought it here. It just, I got lucky in that I, I was able to settle into this farm that is just naturally a great bay for growing oysters. It's a little windy right now, and this constant wind just brings cold, nutrient-rich water that's also high in salinity. Okay. And so the oysters take on that flavor. So if it was uh, in a shallower part of the farm, um, the oyster meat itself is going to be a little, um, a little tougher, a little stronger. The muscle will be more developed. You'll, you'll get an oyster further back in the bay, especially in a rainy year, okay. that's a little sweeter than something that's a little closer to the mouth of the bay. That's going to be a little saltier and brinier. About 90% of what leaves this farm is this size oyster right here. It's the ideal size for customers. Yes, yeah, exactly. Easy, one shot. So what we're going to do is go in with the hinge. You guys know this drill. We got a nice, beautiful oyster in there. It's for me? This is for you. All right, all right. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Oh, God. You ever seen the uh, Live in Pompeii Pink Floyd? Ooh, the oysters are good today. Yes. <laughs> yes, this time of year. Well, they're French oysters. I like to think that oysters transcend national barriers. The oysters don't transcend barriers. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> nice, brother. If you like this episode, you want to see more. I'm choking in. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to meet with a master tofu maker. Koki at Neji Tofu strives to keep the process alive that utilizes knowledge and technique.